So the first question says, Dear Ajahn, if a person who practices meditation and upholds the precepts strictly for years, does dana yet still has no improvement in his spiritual life, health, work, relationship is also not going well, does that mean this person is experiencing his bad karma from the past to obstruct his progress both spiritually and worldly? If so, what to do to improve the situation? Um, could be, <laughs> maybe, but uh, obviously I don't know the person and the exact <coughs> circumstances. One thing with what we call spiritual practice or Dhamma practice is that we have to be very patient. <coughs> the growth of <coughs> the growth of our um, faculties, spiritual faculties, you know, our, our uh, practice of sila, generosity, compassion, mindfulness, insight takes time, and so obviously one problem we face is what we call old karma, which is a very general term. <clears throat> old habits, probably the most obvious thing, you know, you, you bring habits with you already into the world when you're a baby, you just don't realize it from your past life. And then in this life, we also build up <coughs> new habits, some of which are maybe not so good, not so conducive to our well-being or the well-being of others. Um, could you pour me some water? So that's the first thing. We've got to deal with our own accumulated um, negative habits of body, speech and mind from this life, from last life. And some of that will come up as obstructive karma. So an obvious one might be something like laziness. You. You think, oh, I should really meditate today. And then another voice says, oh, but I'm tired and sleep on or sit and watch my movie or whatever. You know, find some other thing to do. <clears throat> Sometimes precepts the same. We may, may say, oh, I keep the five precepts. And maybe most of the time we do. But if there's some particular challenge or temptation, maybe you break the precepts quite easily. You know, your, your keeping of the precepts is more just because there's nothing, there's no reason to break them. It's not because you're very mindful and very committed to the precepts. It's more just the circumstances haven't tested you yet. And so when there is a test, you <clears throat> may break the precept and you say, well, generally I keep the precepts, but it was just this one time. But actually, maybe your commitment to precepts is weak or you're not very continuous, same with meditation <clears throat> and so on. So that's one th also one thing to look at. We bring, um, can we get a cup, no, a small cup, that size cup. So um, you've got to look at what you bring into your practice from the past, look at your commitment in the present, And be honest as well. <clears throat> and often we're not that honest. We um, we haven't looked that closely at our own life, maybe at our own practice. So um, you know there'll be a range of reasons if somebody is not progressing. But that doesn't mean to say give up. Of course, don't give up. Or think maybe that the practice that the Buddha taught is wrong or somehow not effective. It, we may also have to look more at our own commitment, our own um, uh, how, how well we're practicing with a very honest, kind of sincere look at what we're doing. <clears throat> and sometimes we have to accept, yeah, maybe we have some very deeply ingrained bad habits, meaning what we call kilesa, maybe uh, particularly err on the side of anger or greed or jealousy. And it may take a long time to work through some of that. And so even though you are putting effort into other aspects in your practice, it may take um, time to work through a particular problem. 
other things are like you know external circumstances as well. You know, some people may meditate, keep the precepts, have faith in the Buddha, but their external circumstances are very poor. They're not the conditions are not good. You know, try and imagine you're in one of those countries where there's a war going on. You say, <clears throat> I'm trying to keep the precepts, I'm trying to meditate, I'm trying to practice Buddhism, but there'll be immense challenges. Or you're in a situation where you're very poor. You know, just working to keep things going, make ends meet. Uh, or illness is another one. So you get ill. You may be practicing correctly, but the illness is a, is a challenge because you're in a lot of pain or very weak. So you have to look at the, be the whole picture, the big picture. There may be old karma blocking or, or obstructing you. There may be hidden kilesas you haven't recognized. And then there may be external circumstances as well that make it hard. Okay, thank you, Ajahn, for that wonderful answer. Let's move on to question two. Okay, it's a little bit of a follow up to the first question. Um, if the past karma is too heavy, maybe he needs to suffer in this life to exhaust his bad karma for the good karma to ripen in the next life? Maybe they have to do what? Maybe he needs to suffer in this life to exhaust his bad karma well, yes, that could be true. Um, <clears throat> the worst obstructive karma that the Buddha talked about is what we call anantariya karma, five of them. Trying to kill the Buddha, although it's said to be impossible to kill the Buddha, but you may draw blood from a Buddha. Um, killing an arahant, killing your parents, your mother or your father, or making the Sangha split apart. They're the worst kinds of karma. Obviously, most people probably won't ever make those kinds of karma, but they may take steps towards it. Probably the most common one would be um, turning against your parents. Say, so, you know, as a child, you're brought up, maybe you build up um, a real complex with your mum or your dad. <coughs> There may be reasons for that. They may have made mistakes or neglected you or something. Or it may just be you with your, you, know, you may have um, certain views that make you turn against your parents. And that's considered to be a very powerful obstructive karma. You, you may not physically harm them, but you always think of them with anger and you always uh, um, you, you, you learn not to respect authority figures or anyone in any kind of position of responsibility as a kind of knock-on effect from turning against your parents, say. So, and it, from what I can see, that can be a real problem for many people. They've, well, they've turned against their parents in one way or another, and then it comes out in their work, their relationships, many things. Um, and they'll suffer, <laughs> for sure. Any kind of negative karma that comes up and, and that prompts us to act in negative ways will prolong suffering, of course. Um, but having said that, we've all got karma to work through from this life and maybe from past lives, and it can be worked through. So not to be too um, gloomy about the whole thing. You know, we, we have examples from the time of the Buddha, and you could say in the modern age as well, say someone like Angulimala, we would call him a mass murderer or serial killer these days, killed hundreds of people because of wrong view, not because he was full of anguish, it's because he had a wrong view and thought it was the right way to proceed in his spiritual practice <laughs> through delusion. And eventually the Buddha convinced him not to do this, Eventually, he became an arahant, which is a, the highest happiness. Um, but having become an arahant through his practice, he still had to endure the old karma that he had killed many people, their relatives hated him, 
when they recognized him as a monk, they'd throw stones at him, shout at him, no one would give him food. So the other monks in the temple had to give him food. So even though he's an arahant, completely peaceful, no more anger, his conduct was perfect or, or virtuous, he still had to go through a lot of suffering during the last, that last life. Obviously once he's attained Nibbana, he dies, he goes, he's attained Nibbana, there'll be no more births and no more suffering. And there's others like Patachara, the lady, who lost her kids, her husband, her parents, all in a very short space of time. Basically, she became extremely mentally ill, just deranged. Threw all her clothes off, wandered around the countryside until she met the Buddha, who taught her out of compassion. And she also became an arahant. So she went from being wealthy, good family, good conditions, right downhill, complete, lost everything, lost her mind as well as her, her wealth, lost her baby, everything, and then came up again and actually reached Nibbana all in one life. So these kind of situations remind us that nothing is fixed or certain. You know, sure, sometimes, sometimes but there are great obstacles to overcome uh, what you'd call past karma, but they can be. And you know, you meet people who have gone through difficulties, whether it's physical illness, economic collapse, you know, somebody who's been working, lost every lost their job, lost all their money, gone bankrupt. Um, sometimes disasters, like I often quote uh, the family in Thailand who had a business making auto parts, very successful, wealthy family doing very well and their factory, I don't know how long ago now, maybe six, seven years ago, completely flooded out. That year they had very bad floods in Thailand. So they lost everything, the factory, the stock, all the people that they employed and they employed a lot of people, had to let them go, lost everything, back to scratch. And mom, dad and the children who were now more adult sat around and said, what can we do? We've lost everything because of this flooding, uh, including their house was you know, ruined. And they said, well, if nothing else, we know mum cooks really good noodles. <coughs> <laughs> Most mums cook good noodles, but you know, that was their answer. Oh, mum cooks good noodles, we can sell noodles. And obviously they had a lot of business skills from there company which they now put into noodle selling and making. So they started with one hawker stall on the street. Was the very cheapest, simplest way of selling noodles. Mum, dad, children, they're all doing that. And because mum did make good noodles, had a good recipe, a very popular, they sold a lot of noodles and they knew how to talk to people and get people to buy their product and so they bought more stalls, eventually they bought a shop and then they opened a chain of shops and they just went in a totally different direction from the worst back to success again. And you know, everyone will know somebody like that. In one way or another they've maybe gone really down on their luck and then come up again. You have to ask, why do people come up again? Well, maybe, obviously, hard work, faith. Maybe people have faith that it can be done, they can do it, it can be done. Maybe they have sometimes support, they get good advice, good teachers, good advice. You know, there'll be a range of things that they do to deal with their difficult situation and then they come up again. And you learn that in meditation. You know, from sometimes your mind is really confused, angry, upset, frustrated, whatever, and you learn to calm it down. And if you meditate regularly, you'll be learning to overcome many, many mental obstacles to the point where maybe you get quite good at it. And so nothing bothers you. You, know, you get angry, but you don't hold on to your anger. You have worries, but you don't hold on to them and you learn to keep your mind in a, in a much better state, so you, your mind goes up. So you learn many things from the practice, and yes, sometimes we have 
strong abstractive karma, things don't go well, but it's not not fixed. And there may be a way through it. Thank you, Ajahn. On to question two. Dear Ajahn, in the context of love and relationships, if we think that a potential partner does not reciprocate our feelings, how are we able to control our emotions such as sadness, jealousy, and disappointment? How can we maintain neutrality until the future becomes clearer or until we are less interested in the person? The, yeah. uh, a very common situation. You're asking a single monk to, <laughs> for relationship advice, so I could only answer the way a monk answers. <laughs> But, surprisingly enough, the Buddhist teachings probably can handle this one. And there's many good things that the Buddha gave, many good words of advice the Buddha gave. So, one thing he said is if a couple or a couple, you know, two people are going to live together successfully, meaning for a long time, and be happy, they have to have certain things that more or less match, certain qualities. So one is similar view. So they might get their views and beliefs from Buddhism to start with, and they, but they have to have similar views, so they're not always arguing about everything. <laughs> sure, we have differences, of course, but there must be also some things that we see have a similar outlook on many things. So the Buddha said similar level of faith in Buddhist teachings, similar level of morality, in the sense that ideally if one person sees the value of trying to follow five precepts, say, eh? they may not be perfect, make mistakes sometimes, lose their mindfulness sometimes, but generally they try to. Well, the other partner, if they also f think that and try that, then you can live to probably live together quite happily, successfully. But if one person is happily killing <laughs> or stealing, <laughs> Or doesn't you know they're not trustworthy in their relationships? They cheat on their partner, or one person. One that I see all the time is one person in the relationship drinks too much, or just drinks. You know. <clears throat> the other may not drink at all or drinks very little. After a while, that becomes a problem, and I know people who have separated simply because one partner is continuously drinking and they're in one state of mind and it affects your health, physical and emotional and mental health. And the other person is not, so after a while they're just going in different directions. Or one person is honest and they would like to work, they don't want to get in debt, they don't want to cheat people, they earn their money, try to earn their money in an honest way. But the other one is not too worried. If they cheat, they fiddle, they lie, they deceive, they don't mind. Again, after a while it's, they're not compatible. So these kind of things, level of faith, your view, your beliefs, your precepts, your morality, are very good predictors of whether the couple can stay together or not, and whether the relationship will be successful. Obviously there's more abstract qualities we need. We need to have kindness, respect, um, willingness to compromise, all kinds of good qualities we have to develop for a successful relationship. But similarly, if you're looking at your relationship, well, you can use these ways of looking, judging a relationship or, or um, measuring a relationship, you can use them. So you say, hmm, he or she has totally different views on things than me. You know, whether it's politics or anything, you know, they're totally different. He or she doesn't care about hurting other people or telling lies or something. He or she um, is not interested in Buddhism maybe. If you're, you are, if you do have faith in Buddhism and your partner is completely against it, well, that's a very difficult situation. So if they have a really strong faith in another religion, that often is a problem, or they're just very anti-religion. They don't have to be Buddhist, but if, you know, if there are these kind of strong differences, it'll come up. 
what happens if you stay together? Well, maybe you have kids. And you say, well, I want to bring my kids up following the Buddha's teachings. And they say, no, we're going to do it a different way. So you argue again, don't you? So um, these are a way you can look at relationships. And you have to accept if you don't know someone yet, maybe you've just met them, you've got to know them for a short period of time, well, gradually you will get to know them. And if it comes out that all these differences are there, you just have to accept it. Don't you? You're not compatible. You should really have that in your mind at the beginning when you first start dating or whatever. You say, okay, I hope it works. I want to meet somebody who is a good person, kind person, hard-working person, all the qualities you think are important. You hope to meet someone like that. And, and they must be good-looking too. <laughs> And all the others, oh, and rich, sorry, they've got to be rich. Yeah. <laughs> You've got all these kind of tick-the-box things. <laughs> but, you know, you hope for that, but you should also have, part of your mind should be saying, if it doesn't work out, I'll accept that. If they're diff too different from me, incompatible, I'll accept that, and I'll be honest and move on and, and separate, you know. And do it early, do it quickly before you've put down roots or had children together or built, you know, bought a house together or something and do it early and accept. Sometimes we f find the wrong person first. Maybe later we'll find somebody who's the right person. Um, met someone today who uh, started, well not dating, but got to know their partner in kindergarten. <laughs> We're right through life and they're still together. Must be some kind of world record, I'd say. <laughs> Quite rare now. Um, but the Buddha said to know somebody, you've got to live with them or get be with them for a long time. Because things change, don't they? You, how many couples, say they're dating or they're starting their relationship, everyone speaks very nicely, everyone puts an effort in, it's all good, and then as soon as some kind of commitment is made, you know, in the old days you say you get engaged or, or get married, everything changed. <laughs> and I hear this all the time as well, you know, he was fine until we got married and then <laughs> it's like after one day he's just changed into another person. <laughs> so that's just social kind of behavior, isn't it? When you're new and you have, you're trying to impress the other and you want to hang on to the other, you act in one way. Once you think you've got them, you, you, know, you sort of relax and then the real you comes out. We have to be ready for that. And it's no shame to say, look, this is not working. <laughs> you know, do it early, do it quickly. And you know, maybe you'll meet someone else. Or if you don't meet someone else that's compatible, better to be on your own than be living with someone who you just don't get on with. No point arguing. I mean, it's a terrible way to bring kids in the world, isn't it? Mum and dad are always arguing, always fighting. That will affect the kids. Sure, we have disagreements, but you don't want to have a household full of, you know, hatred and anguish to bring kids up. You want a house where there's enough <laughs> good qualities, love, respect, kindness, that the kids feel confident and happy. That's your goal. Um, so before you've had kids, you know, try and sort this, this particular thing out. Um, in the worst case scenario, say you get married, and then after five, ten years, say after ten years, your partner cheats on you, and everything falls apart. It's not the end of the world. If you have your own practice of the Dhamma, faith in the Dhamma, you have your own good qualities, and you haven't done anything particularly wrong, you know, this is a real generalization I'm making now, but say you haven't done much wrong, but your partner did, and they go off, nothing's lost, your goodness is still with you. And I've known people like this, and the partner has treated them really terribly. And I, they come to me, obviously they're sad and crying and whatever, and you just look, you're still the same good person. It's them that's done wrong, and you just have to get that clear in your mind if everything goes wrong. So, you know, there's many scenarios, but the important thing is use what you learn from Buddhism. That will help you to think straight, 
to take your time, to be patient, to use good ways of judging character, you know, qualities like morality and kindness and all of that. And accept sometimes it won't work out, it may not work out. And so you have to you know, separate, but try and do that quickly rather than hanging on, suffering. <laughs> of course, if you separate from someone, yeah, you feel sad, but you get over it. Yeah, they're still alive. They can, and you just be happy for them if they go off and find someone else that suits them better. Good, fine, be happy for them. It's no loss to you to let someone go off and find another partner. Even if you're single, but you are you have no problems because you're single, you're not arguing with anyone. If you meet someone good, if you don't, never mind. You're happy. Then you can come and join us in the monastery. <laughs> 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 they often think that so many people ask me Ajahn, did you become a monk because you, <laughs> you split out with your girlfriend <laughs> uh, no that isn't the case I, I, I had to tell my girlfriend I'm going to become a monk and they didn't want to split up it was quite hard, and many monks have been through that. I know, I know one monk, I won't mention his name, but he was engaged to be married and they just bought the house. And then he went off and became a monk. It was a very tricky situation. But everything ha can happen. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Moving on to question three. A family member refuses or is incapable of taking responsibility for their own life and their personal affairs are causing much stress to those around them, especially aging parents. What to do in this situation? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, if you're following the Buddhist teachings, you know, one of your goals is not to bring suffering to your parents. Um, whether you like them or not, you know, their personality, their character, they've done so much for you, bringing you into the world. Usually speaking, they care for you, bring you up, give you everything, sacrifice so much. Um, your, your aim is to you may not be able to help them that much, or you may be. If you can help them, great. If you can give something back to them. But at very least, don't hurt them. Don't harm them. Either with your speech, your actions, or just by giving them a lot of worries. By, by you know, leading your own life in a not a very good way so that they, they can see that and that causes them worry. <clears throat> That's an important sort of goal you're trying to achieve is not hurt your parents. But then of course, like you say in the question, some people don't realize this, they're just lost in their own world, their own situation. So you do the best you can. If it's a family member, a brother, a sister, someone close, well, see what you can do. <laughs> if you've got a few siblings, you know, those bigger families, sometimes you have a discussion about the one who's causing all the trouble, what can the others, others do? And I know that happens, you know, again, I hear about this and sometimes very frustrating, but they do what they can to try and manage this person who is making a mess of their life or you know, loses all their money, gets into debt, they're always borrowing money. There's usually lifestyle things that are causes for this, aren't there? Some, somebody is always borrowing money, you never pays it back. Somebody's gambling, somebody's drinking, somebody is womanizing or, or, or cheating on their partner or something. You know, there's all these kind of behavioral things that often you can see and that's part of the problem. So you try and have discussion with those who are involved. Sometimes you leave parents out if they're aging and then you don't want to worry them. Well, the younger ones maybe. It could be family members, or friends, anyone who's involved. See if anyone is interested or can come together to sort of talk and find ways to limit the damage is one thing. <laughs> 
limit the damage, but also to, to get to help the person who is in this situation in whatever way is needed. Um, partly you have to manage expectations as well. You want to help someone, but maybe they're not helping themselves, they're not willing to change. They don't listen to reason, you know, you, you try and give them good advice and they say, who are you? Because you know, a lot of people, they have their ego, they have their pride, they don't want to be told by someone else in the family what to do, how to live. So there's all these problems. Um, you do the best you can. <laughs> and depends on the situation. Sometimes all you can do is just get on with your own life and try and lead your own life in a good way. And that's being an example to others. You may not be able to do anything directly to influence this person who's having problems, but at least you're not making their life worse. And maybe you're being a good example in your life. Or maybe you can talk to them, help them in some way. But you have to be careful. Right? The, so many families, you know, you've got one person who's always in debt, always having problem, always out of work, or their, you know, their business always fails, or whatever. And they keep draining the resources of everyone else. So it's just like everything going down a hole. And you just, it's just like sooner or later you have to get to the point, some, you know, depending on the situation, and say, no, enough. The obvious one is gambling. Right? If someone's gambling, they can build up huge debts, which they come back to the parents or the siblings to get, or a wife or a husband to get the money to get out of this debt. And then they go and gamble again, and then, you know, it's just a downward spiral. So those kind of situations, sometimes you have to use tough luck. You say, no, <laughs> no more loans, no more help in that way. I'll give you plenty of love and you know, I'll always <laughs> give you food or something, but I'm not going to give you any more money. Sometimes you have to be tough. <laughs> we have uh, two more questions. Question four. Are there specific short mindfulness practices that can help me create a clearer boundary between work and home life? Work always spills into my personal life. Yeah, I think that's quite common. It doesn't have to be a problem, but sometimes people really enjoy their work, so naturally it will come into their life often uh, in many areas. and. They're happy to devote more time to their work and you know, talk about their work, think about their work. Um, sometimes it's not a problem, even though it can be very time consuming, because they enjoy it. It's part of who they are, sometimes. Other times it's maybe other external pressures, like the company or the boss is always asking for your time. And people get run down, burnt out, tired their family life suffers, their personal life suffers. Um, so you get different situations. Um, <clears throat> I'd recommend if you, one, you listen to Dhamma regularly to get reminders and clarification how to practice. And then you try and put the Dhamma principles into practice in your life, like five precepts. That already is something that's quite challenging in this day and age. Often, even your workplace, they want you to break precepts. Friends want you to break precepts. People you meet, even strangers want you to build, uh, break precepts. All kinds of challenges. But trying to keep five precepts, um, trying to introduce Buddhist principles into your life, so like you know, compassion, kindness on a daily basis. Um, that's your starting point, to try and introduce these qualities into your life, whether you're at work or at home. So if you hear the Dhamma regularly, what does the Buddha say? He will try and um, practice the noble, or cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. So right view, right thought, 
right action, right speech, right livelihood. So right livelihood is one thing. The usual explanation is quite brief from the suttas. It's things like, you know, don't sell weapons. <laughs> <laughs> don't sell drink and drugs. Don't traffic, don't do human trafficking. You know, all these kind of things that are quite common in the news nowadays, all these sort of criminal activities, don't do them, uh, don't kill. So you know, don't be a hunter or run a slaughterhouse if you can avoid it. Um, but also on a more subtle basis, like when you work, try not to oppress other people just in your actions. You know, don't be a bully. Because everyone complains about bullying. I hear it every day. There's some bully in my workplace. So try not to be the bully. Try not to oppress people through your speech, your actions. Try to practice compassion as you work for the people around you as well as yourself. Um, these might be the more subtle aspects of right livelihood. Because if you are a bully or you're pushing yourself so hard that you're getting ill or burnt out or you're pushing other people so hard, they're getting stressed out. You would say that's not really following the Buddhist path, the Noble Eightfold Path. I mean, it's a subtle point because, you know, who's to know whether you're working too hard or pushing someone else too hard? But you have to reflect on it and try and assess your behavior and how you're affecting others as well as yourself. Um, so there's these kind of reflections, how you're, the, the way you earn your money and then the attitude you bring to your livelihood, your job. And then there's of more obvious things, like do you enjoy your job? If you just go to work and you're miserable, you're going to get very angry and you may take that out on other people. So think about that. Maybe there's adjustments we can make in our lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is to introduce Buddhist thinking into the choices, the decisions you make at work as well, at home and other aspects of your life as well. Sometimes value change. So like if you work very hard, that's fine. That's a very good thing. But maybe once in a while you need to go off and do a retreat, a meditation retreat or something. Often people, you know, they never even try it. They don't know, but it may actually be something most people I, find, I talk to, they say if they go and do a 10-day retreat, they find it really um, beneficial better than they thought, and often easier than they thought. Um, when you think about it, you think, oh, I can't do that. Go and do a 10-day retreat, you know, my legs will hurt, and all this, you've got all your excuses. But maybe try it, and it might be better than you think. So also, I'd say, try and see how you can introduce different spiritual inputs into your life. Whether it's you know taking time out to learn meditation or do retreats. Another one is doing dana. <clears throat> I was talking to someone on the plane coming over. They work very hard and they've set up a big company in Melbourne, but they make sure that part of what they do is charity. They have set up um, organizations to help educate poor kids in different parts of the world. Uh, Food, they do food, uh, providing food for the homeless, as well as working very hard. So you have to think, what can you do? Because these kind of inputs bring you some joy and they're teaching you something, aren't they? They're teaching you, well, there's other people around this world, not just me. It's not all about me and my success and getting on. It's also about helping others. And often we can help others we don't realize. We haven't tried it, so we don't know. Maybe you've got many hidden talents and skills that you can try and introduce, which brings both joy, but also helps you in other aspects of your job. It's not like you know, meditation, dana, or charity are not necessarily against work or, or you know, going against the work you do. It may actually complement and support the work you do. So sometimes we have to experiment a bit, try things. And sure, we may find something doesn't work, but sometimes we're happily surprised and you find something does work and it helps us and maybe helps other people. And you 
We have time, yeah. Not going anywhere. <laughs> All right, last question. I feel very lonely as a single person. How can I learn to be better without feeling like I am missing out on a connection or companionship of a relationship? Yeah, very common experience <laughs> in this day and age. Probably nothing new, I'm sure. Thousands of years ago, people were lonely as well. So it's a part of the human experience. Sometimes we feel lonely. Um, human beings are social creatures. Look at this, We're, we come together for different reasons, for work, for social and you know entertainment and stuff but also for religion and other things meditation really is something you can practice totally alone but often we do it together why because when you meditate with other people you often try harder <laughs> <laughs> we benefit from other people so um, loneliness you know it's just highlighting sometimes our life is a bit out of balance sometimes not always sometimes you know we 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 do it to ourselves without realizing and especially nowadays because there's so much uh, technology available and everyone's you know lives in their own little world their house their apartment their place where they've got it is very easy to start cutting off from other people and and the demands of work as well. You go to work, you give all your time, energy, come home, you're very tired. So maybe you just, you know, do your own thing and you just haven't got any energy for anyone else. It's quite common. And everyone's got a phone. So, you know, even when you're in a social position, uh, situation, everyone's on their phone. So not talking to each other. They talk to each other on the phone. You know, we text, we video, we do everything on the phone. But well, that's remote, isn't it? It's not giving you any human warmth when you read a text. Yeah, it might make you laugh or give you information or whatever, but it's not the same as looking at someone, being with someone, sharing time, even sharing difficulties with another person can help you through the difficulty. So that's one of the dangers now is we're so absorbed into our own little world and our technology that Perhaps loneliness is coming up more of a problem. Um, <clears throat> so obvious sort of solution is we'll get out more. Make yourself, even if you're shy or you're lazy or you're awkward, make yourself get out. In, if there are good social situations that are maybe better, you know, like helping people when you're coming together to help people or coming together to do something that's useful we should try that sometimes um so one sort of simple example on a more meditative level a well, loneliness will come up from probably most people at some point but the aim is to not dwell on it not stick with it just say oh it's another feeling sometimes we feel overwhelmed by too many people too much going on Sometimes we feel lonely, there's no one around, there's no one I can confide in or talk to. But as a state of mind, just observe, well, how long does your lonely feeling last? It may be just a twinge, a few moments, or it may be you know, a longer period of time, and maybe a recurring theme over a period of time. You, you know, it's obvious if you've had a relationship and you suddenly split with that person, you're going to feel lonely for a long while until you get more used to being alone. So you have to think of, you, first of all, you have to observe what's going on in your mind and your body and your, your life. Secondly, you have to learn to think about it in a, a wise way, in a reasoned way. And if you've, um, you know, you've left your job, you might feel lonely. If you've left your school, you feel lonely you've left a relationship, you might feel lonely. Well, sit down and say, okay, I've got the feeling, but I know where it's coming from, I know why it's here. I'll just be patient with this. And things change. And, you know, no one's feeling lonely all the time. It will come and go. And you can use the techniques of meditation 
vipassana, reflecting on in, uh, on the changing nature of your moods, your feelings, to help you. You say, oh, yesterday I felt really lonely, but now it's gone. And when you notice something's gone, you know mm, it's temporary. It's not. It's not a permanent state of affairs. That helps you to deal with it better. And the other kind of Buddhist teaching for dealing with loneliness is developing metta, goodwill. Out of goodwill comes compassion as well. <clears throat> you know, don't wait for somebody else to come along and fill up your life so you don't feel lonely. You know, that may happen, but it may not. You have to go and make your own effort. Develop the kindness, the goodwill towards others. If you're on your own, have goodwill for yourself and for all the others you know about, even though they're not there. Or when you're with other people, we'll develop goodwill for them. We practice on three levels. Your goodwill starts as an intention, a thought. May others be well, may I be well. Then it goes into speech, so you reflect in your speech, your goodwill, your kindness. And then in action, you're actually doing things for other people, helping out, whatever. So three levels. And this is something you learn as a monk, because as a monk we often are in lonely situations. You may be practicing totally on, alone on retreat. You live in a little hut, you know, in our mon monastery, and most forest monasteries. You live in a little hut on your own. You do see other monks, and the other monks you live with are very supportive and kind. So that's helpful, but you also spend a lot of time on your own. So you learn instead of feeling lonely and like a victim, I'm lonely, my life's no good, you say, oh, this is, this is a chance to do things. I can do things when I'm alone. You know, there's less obstructions and less distractions. I can learn new things. New, as a monk, you learn new chants or learn some skills. Um, and so even loneliness, you can see this is an opportunity. And you develop your good goodwill for yourself and your desire for yourself to improve and learn things and get on. Maybe later you can overcome your loneliness also by helping others later. But first you work with yourself. And rather than seeing yourself as a victim and a bad luck, I'm on my own, always on my own, my life is no good, blah, blah, blah. You say, oh, this is an excellent opportunity. I can meditate in peace, I can read my book, I can learn my new thing, do this, do that, on my own. And what many monks find is that, you know, maybe at first they're new to the monk's life, they have a bit of loneliness come up and they're not sure what to do with that feeling. Later, they realize how lucky they are living this <laughs> life of this lonely or solitary life, and then they actually like it, and then they don't want, you know, you know they say, oh, I don't, I don't want to get married, I don't want to have a family, I'm happy being alone, <laughs> because it's easy. So say when people try it on uh, retreat, sometimes they try not talking, not saying a single word. You know, if there's an emergency, okay, you talk, but just not saying a single word for 10 days. It's always the same. The first few days are hard because you want to talk, you're looking to make friends, talk to people. So you have to stop that desire to speak and that's quite hard work. And you see people working on it, you know, they sort of walk up to someone and no, 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 I can't, oh no. <laughs> it's a bit funny when you see someone do that or yourself, you know, you're about to speak and then, oh no, I can't, okay. Forget that, <laughs> you walk away. Or, or the worst one is some people, they're always writing notes because they can't speak. They've made a vow, I'm not going to speak. So I need this. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> they send up all these notes out because they, they think they're fulfilling the rule, I'm not speaking, but you know, it all comes out on notes or texts or something. But what people find is after a few days they get used to it, it's easier, and then it's quite enjoyable. And as it becomes enjoyable, less distractions, no arguments, no problems, they like it. And usually by the end of the retreat, they don't want to stop. It's like, oh, I'm happy with this, I want to just carry on. 
indefinitely. <laughs> it feels like that anyway. Obviously, they always end up talking again. But it feels like, oh, this is actually very enjoyable. And you realize you can be happy on your own. You can be happy with others. And that's what, as a famous saying of Ajahn Chah, he always said, your aim in the practice is to get to the point where you're the same, whether you're on your own or you're with others. You're not stressed because you're with others and you're not clinging to others to make you happy. You're not stressed when you're on your own or you're, and you're not clinging to that to try and get rid of other people. You're, you can adapt and be mindful and happy in whatever the situation. That's your goal. So you're alone, fine. You're with others, fine. That would be your goal.